Good morning, West Village Church. It's so good to see all of you virtually as we gather together to worship at home. And uh, just before we get into worship in song and in the hearing of his word and celebrating around the Lord's table, I just have a few announcements. Uh, This is the month of February, and we are celebrating Family Day this month. We celebrate Valentine's Day. It's a focus on love and family, and we wanted to highlight love and family here as a church family and how we can love one another, even through these really hard times. You know, I revealed last Sunday that I, uh, the pandemic has made it so I love ice cream. I didn't realize how much I did. And the other thing that the pandemic has done is made for me and many, many people this, uh, this acknowledgement, this realization of just how important connecting with other people during this time really is. We crave it, we long for it, and every little taste of it is just so sweet and good for our souls. The pandemic has made that really hard. I acknowledge that. And for the church, it's made it really hard for us to gather together. And that's what church is. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church literally means called out ones. And we are called out of the world by uh, Jesus. And we are saved. We called from death to life and from despair to hope and from hate to love and all of these things from being alone to being in community, true community. Yeah, we are church. This is what we are here for. He calls us out to be the church and he keeps us in the world though to to bring his message, to continue to go on his mission. And he calls us to meet weekly, to gather together, minimum. but, But really in this time, that makes it really hard in person. I get that. But here's the thing. Jesus said, not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Now think about gates for a second. Gates don't attack, gates defend. Do you know what that means? That means hell is on the defense. The church is on the offense. And during this time, it's so easy for us to become passive, to not continue to be the called out community that we're called to be. We, we, we can often think of like, oh, you know, the church is going to withstand all of the different attacks from, from the devil and from hell. When in reality, the church is not just going to withstand, the church is going to attack. It is going to bring the message of the gospel of the hope of Jesus Christ to people who are destined in eternity to hell and storm those gates, trash those gates, and call people into the community as Christ calls them and we bring his message of hope. And that's something that we need to continue to do, even when it's hard, even when it's a pandemic. I know it's not the ideal that we can't gather in person, but just because we can't hit the ideal doesn't mean we should just wait until we can have the ideal and miss out on the opportunities we have in the meantime, the creative ways that we can connect virtually. And it's important. It's really important. I know there's times where uh, it can feel like, you know, oh, you know, I really don't want to go to small group tonight, or I just don't have the bandwidth. I've been on Zoom all day. I know for Ruth and I, that's been the case a few times. But then as we actually enter in to that time with brothers and sisters of Christ, and we encourage each other, we pray with each other, it's not like a staff meeting or a board meeting. It is connecting together in the community of Christ, the called out ones together. And so over the month of February, we are church, and we're going to highlight the different ways that people are connecting to community, uh, even now in the middle of a lockdown. And we invite you, if you're not part of community yet with us, to take that step. Don't wait. Don't wait just because you're weary, because you might end up withering. I know that could be the case. The longer we go without it, the harder and harder it is to get back in, and the more and more we desperately need it. And so we're going to be highlighting C groups. We're going to be highlighting Open C and the people, the individuals who are part of those things. We're going to highlight uh, the serving on teams that's happening right now and even serving our community in groups together as the church, as the called out ones. Because church is not a building. It's not a brand. It's not a program. It's not a pastor. At the end of the day, church is people. And we are called out even now, even when it's hard, to be together in Jesus' name. So one of the ways that we're going to do that is today we're going to celebrate communion. 
And normally we would do communion virtually at the end of the service as part of the video. And so if you're watching this outside of worship at home time, uh, you can, uh, just like normal, the video will play and communion will be that way. But if you're watching live right now together with us on Sunday morning, then we're going to actually go to the virtual lobby and invite you to come with us, bring your elements, and we're going to take uh, communion together uh, as most in person as we can safely do right now in the Zoom. You don't have to say anything, and if you're really shy, you don't even have to put on your camera, but we are going to take communion live together. One other announcement before we start, and I hope that you will experience community and get connected or continue. Do not grow weary in doing good. Let's continue to gather in community. The last announcement I got has to do with our community as well and raising up young leaders and giving them an opportunity to grow in the gift and to affirm the calling that God has placed on their lives. And one of those individuals who's part of West Village Church is a young man named Caleb Gagne. Now, Caleb is a, a student at Heritage Bible College. Many of you know Pastor Rick, who's the president there. It's where I went to college. And uh, Caleb is almost done his degree. And so we're going to give him an opportunity to open God's word with us this morning. And I know the Lord is going to bless us through the ministry of his word and also bless us as we encourage Caleb and this young pastor as he grows and develops in the gifts that God has given him. And so before Caleb comes on, let's worship the Lord together as Sarah and her team lead us in song this morning. So glad that you're here with us. Sweet. 
together. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you never give up on us and you are always there and you love us no matter what. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time we've had to worship together. Amen. Good morning, everyone, or evening, or I guess whenever you're watching this. Uh, my name is Caleb Gagne, and I am super excited to be here with you all today, even if it is just virtually. 
Um, some of you know me, some of you probably have met me growing up or in recent times, and some of you, I bet, have probably even never heard of me or uh, and especially don't know who I am. So I thought that I would just start today by saying a few things about myself. Uh, so firstly, I am engaged to your wonderful children's director here, Emily Smallgange, and we're so excited to be getting married in the fall. Um, I was born and raised in a Christian home. I was saved when I was eight years old and then baptized when I was in grade eight. And I am currently in my final year at Heritage College and Seminary studying for my Bachelor of Religious Education, or BRE for short. I really want to thank Pastor Jeff and West Village Church for having me this morning uh, and giving me this opportunity. I'm so incredibly thankful. And I want to thank all of you for inviting me into your homes on your TVs or your phones or your laptops or however you're watching this today and inviting me to be a part of your Sunday morning worship. I'm so excited for what God has for us this morning. Have you ever asked yourself, what am I supposed to do? This question can be asked in so many different ways. Maybe um, you're feeling stuck spiritually and you might be asking God, what am I supposed to do? Or um, maybe your spouse asked you to take the garbage out. And since for some reason we chose, well, at least some of us chose to live in Ottawa. And lately it's been about negative 25 with the wind chill. And so you go to take the garbage out and the garbage can is stuck. And so instead of leaving it outside for your raccoons and squirrels to get it, you bring it back inside. And then your spouse sees it and asks you what happened. And you go, well, what am I supposed to do? The garbage can was stuck. Or maybe you're feeling like I have been lately over these quarantine times, feeling lethargic, or maybe even feeling useless, saying, God, what am I supposed to be doing these days? The question has so many layers and so many scenarios that can be brought up for, but all have one thing in common, don't they? That is the lack of an answer. The lack of knowing the next step to take, being at the end of your rope and not knowing what to do. COVID has us all in our houses, not seeing our friends and our families. Human connection is found over a screen. And a lot of people have lost their jobs over the past little while. It is easy to not know what to do. Or it might feel like there is nothing to do these days. Today, we are going to be diving into three answers that Paul gives us of what we can do each and every day. So today, we are going to be diving into Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18. I would encourage you to open up your Bibles if you have one at home, or if not, you can actually just open your phone up and Google Philippians 2, 12 to 18, and I'll be reading out of the ESV today. So you can just Google that, and it'll be right there on your phones. So let me pray, and we'll get into today's message. God, I thank you so much just for the work that you've been doing on my heart. God, I pray um, today that you would shine through me and that um, your word would be taught truthfully, God. I pray that um, you would use me to teach myself and to teach your people the message that you have prepared through me today, God. And I pray that uh, you would just take me away and that um, people would just see your message, God, and that um, you would just use me to tell them what um, you want to say, God. And I pray that you would even just work on my heart as I preach this, God, that you would teach me what to do as I preach this, God. And I pray that we would all have open hearts, God, that you would soften our hearts so that we would be ready to receive the message that you have prepared for us today. God, I do pray that uh, you would just speak through me. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. So before I read our passage today, there are actually a couple things that I want to bring up, and I think that they will help us understand exactly what Paul is trying to teach us through these words. So the first is um, actually just a reminder that what we're going to be reading today is true. It actually happened. It is, a, it is not a fictional story, but it is actually a non-fictional story. Paul wrote a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to the church that was in Philippi, and he wrote this letter around 61 AD, and he wrote it, again, to real people. A real person, Paul, wrote this to real people. There is actually still a city in Greece today called 
Philippi, um, and there's actually also one called Philippoi. So many historians believe that Philippoi was Philippi and that it was conquered and renamed Philippoi. Um, but again, there is still today a city called Philippi. So I'm not a historian. I am not good with geography. I hardly pass grade 10 geography. But what I do know is that this is real. Again, Paul was a real person writing a real letter to a real church. And when we remember that what we're reading is real, it can bring it to life in our hearts and it can make it so much more real for us. The second thing that I think is important is to understand where we are at in chapter 2. So the beginning of chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, are Paul highlighting Jesus' perfect example of what humility is supposed to look like. These verses can be summarized by verse 8 uh, in Philippians 2, which says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, Christ put aside his deity and perfectly submitted himself to his Father, dying on the cross for me and for you. Now, that is an entire sermon in and of itself, so I won't get too much into that today. But in light of Christ's perfect example of what humility should look like, we find ourselves in Philippians 2, 12 through 18, which say, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So focusing back on the question at hand, what am I supposed to do? Paul gives us three major answers of what we can do each and every day. So what am I supposed to do? Well, the first thing that I can do is that I can let the Lord work in me. I can let the Lord work in me. Look at what verse 12 and 13 say. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul is writing to the Philippians saying, I know that you guys have obeyed almost every single thing that I've told you to do. But what I need you to do right now is I need to take the faith that I've been teaching you about and I need you to make it your own. I need you to take that into your own hands. He says with, he says he wants them to experience God the way that he's experienced God with fear and trembling he talks about. He so desperately wants them to experience God the same way that he's experienced God in his life. So he encourages them to take their faith into their own hands. This kind of looks like uh, almost all testimonies really that start with, I was born and raised in a Christian home. You might remember that that's exactly how my testimony started. As one grows up in a Christian home, they, their parents are superheroes and they can do no wrong. Whatever their parents tell them, they do, right? Your parents tell you to go to church, so you go to church. Your parents tell you to pray before meals, so you pray before meals. But as that student grows up, and as that student probably gets to high school, maybe grade 12 or around that age, this student begins to learn that their parent isn't exactly perfect. And they have to start to take their faith into their own hands. They have to take their faith away from their parents' hands, and their faith would be their own. They're no longer, they're no longer supposed to be telling their kids what to do and how to believe God. And that student, that child, needs to 
understand what they believe God, and they need to start serving God out of their own will. He also tells us that he knows that it's not going to be easy. And that's okay because the Lord is with them and they're going to have his help throughout the entire process. Look at verse 13. God wants to use you, but first he has to work in you. Many of you probably know Joy Malloy. He was uh, the youth pastor at the Met for a very long time. Um, and he was actually my youth pastor. And throughout the time that I was going to youth, he would always say, not if Bible school, but which Bible school, inferring that um, it doesn't matter about, which, about if the matter is going to Bible school or not, that's decided. Go to Bible school and then focus on which Bible school to go to. So as I was going, I didn't really think about it much because, you know, I was younger and it wasn't on my heart. I had a plan to become a mechanic, join the military, then probably one day start my own auto shop. But in my grade 12 year, not if Bible school, but which Bible school, really started to weigh on my heart. And I really believed that God wanted me to go to Bible school. So the new plan was to go to Texas for a year for Bible school, come back, become a mechanic, join the military, and then maybe one day start my own shop. That was the plan. But little did I know that my year that I spent in Texas was going to be one of the hardest years of my life. You see, while I was in Texas, the Lord really began to work on my heart. Two of my really close friends had to move back to their homes away from Texas. My girlfriend at the time actually had just broken up with me, so I was going through a lot of loss and heartbreak. And I also remember going through Bible stories that I had only gone through in Sunday school before, like David and Goliath and Job and Jonah. And these stories being not so cute and little anymore, but actually having so much more to say. And although that may, may make a lot of people encouraged and may excite them, it actually made me really question what I believed and made me question what I had been taught at church. I remember being so upset with God and crying and being angry and yelling at him and asking him why he was making me go through all of these hard things. I remember him bringing me to understand that these things were him working on my heart and that this might sound cheesy, but I felt like an onion that God had to peel me back layer by layer by layer. And I know it sounds cheesy, but it's true. And I felt like God had to remove all of the layers that were me so that he could rebuild me to be someone who honors him and glorifies him and worships him. Before that, I really never focused on him. I never really put him first. Every decision was really for myself. But after this, God started to fuel this fire inside of me that I was just adoring his word. And I was so excited to read his word. And I was, we were spending five hours a day in God's word in class. So three hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, every single day. And God started to make me crave his word. And I was excited every morning to wake up and read God's word. And I remember that his word became I'm going to say not enough for me. Now, God's word will always be enough. And it was not that I became too good for it or that I didn't need it anymore. No, I still need it every day. And God's word will always be enough. But reading it and digesting it wasn't enough. I actually had to go and tell people about what God was teaching me. I had to go and tell people about what I was learning. I remember I would wake up and I would go to a room by myself and I would read my Bible for about an hour every day. And God would be teaching me things and bringing me through things and connecting the dots through different passages. And I would go into the other room and I would tell my friends, like, guys, are you kidding me? Look what God is teaching me. Look what God is showing me. It was so cool. But first, God had to work in me. It was hard and it was painful, but he was there with me every step of the way. Right now, if you're feeling like I do, not knowing where to go or what to do, you can let the Lord work in you. Maybe there is someone listening today that the Lord wants to work in, but they're not sure of it, and they're, they're not understanding what God is trying to do. Or maybe there's someone listening today, and they know God is trying to work on them or work in them, and they're ignoring it, or they're hiding it, or they're putting it away. 
Or maybe there's someone watching today that knows God is working in them and they are just embracing it with open arms saying, yes, Lord, come work in me. And no matter where you're at, no matter what stage of life you're going through, this time of not being able to see people and just being alone, not being able to go anywhere, if you don't know what to do, let the Lord work in you. Ask him to work in you. Now, this is actually a really scary prayer because he might just do it. If you ask God to work in you, he might actually answer you. He might ask you to do things that you're afraid of or that you're not wanting to do. But I promise it's worth it. Psalm 139 says in verses 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Ask God to know you, to search you, to try you, and to lead you to an everlasting way. So if you're asking the question, what am I supposed to do? The first thing is that you can let the Lord work in you. And the second thing is that you can let the Lord work through you. I can let the Lord work through me. Look at verses 14 through 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So in preparing for a sermon or a devotional or just any way that you're really teaching God's word, you have to take a passage and you have to exegete it, right? Many of you probably already know what this word means, exegete. It means to expound on or interpret. You can think about it as taking the text and extracting the truth. So you take your passage, right? Today is Philippians 2, 12 to 18. You take your passage and you pray about it. You ask God to show you what he wants to teach you. And you, want, you ask him to show you what he wants to teach his people. And then you probably look at a commentary or a study Bible or somewhere where someone much smarter than myself, maybe much smarter than yourself, um, has gone and studied this and spent years or months studying this specific passage and have interpreted it, have exegeted it. And so you, you, you check yourself with them so that you make sure you're not missing the mark, that you're pretty well on target. And then you can know that you're not saying things that aren't true. Some passages are um, contextually really difficult to exegete. Sometimes you just don't know what they're saying or where they're going with something. Sometimes there's really tricky Greek or Hebrew words because the Bible wasn't written in English. And you have to work around that. And maybe they mean something at first, but then you dig deeper and you dig into the root words and they mean something completely else. And it changes the passage for the direction it's going and the direction you were going to teach on. Philippians 2.14, however, might just be the easiest verse to exegete ever. There is no hidden meanings. There are no tricky words. It means exactly what it says. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Exactly what it says. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. The New Living Translation says, do everything without complaining and arguing. You see, the all there means all. And it actually really makes sense why. It, there's a reason that Paul doesn't say, do some things or do most things. And you might be thinking, doing all things sounds impossible. And that's because it's supposed to be impossible. Again, Paul doesn't say do some things or do most things because I'd be willing to bet you that I do some things without grumbling or disputing. Or um, I'd be willing to bet that there's people listening today that do most things in their life without complaining or arguing about them. I have friends in my life who do not know Jesus Christ and they do most things in their life without complaining or arguing about them. So yeah, it's entirely humanly possible to do most or many things 
without complaining or arguing about them. But it is only through the work of the Holy Spirit that we can do all things without grumbling or disputing them. So why though? Why is it important to do all things without grumbling or disputing? Well, I'm sure that there are many parents watching this that can instantly think of a reason that it's important to do all things without grumbling or disputing, right? You ask your kid to do something, say, go clean their room. That's pretty common, right? So you ask little Johnny to go clean his room and he fights you tooth and nail on this. He does not want to go clean his room. So you play down the ultimate parent trump card and you say, Johnny, I am not asking, go clean your room. And so little Johnny goes and stomps down the hallway and, you know, kicks things around and shoves it under his bed and maybe puts some Lego in some bins and deems it clean enough and then whines about it the rest of the time. Well, that's not true obedience, is it? You don't feel truly respected as a parent when your child does that, do you? So I am more than sure that God does not feel truly respected or loved when we do that, when we take the things that he puts in front of us and we do them without grumbling or and complaining. I'm sure that that is one reason why we should not do things, why we should do all things without grumbling or disputing. But Paul actually takes it and he tells us exactly why it's important to do all things without grumbling or disputing about them. In verse 15 and 16, Paul says that you may be blameless and innocent Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Here, Paul is telling us exactly why it is so important to live out verse 14. He is saying that in a world so dark and so twisted, the world doesn't have any hope, really. They have no light to look to. They have nothing to show them what is right and what is wrong. He says, but if we take everything that the Lord puts in front of us, and we do that without grumbling or disputing, they will be able to see Jesus in us. They will be able to see the light of Christ that shines through us. They will be able to see how powerful Jesus is. Imagine if I did everything this past year without grumbling or complaining or arguing about them. Now, I got to tell you, I'm a very extroverted person. I need people in my life. So I'd be lying through my teeth if I told you that I went this past year without grumbling or complaining, or arguing about the present circumstances. But imagine if I had. Imagine if I had gone this entire past year without once complaining about anything, or once arguing about anything. Man, the people around me would be like, Caleb, what is happening? How can you do this day in and day out? People keep throwing things at you, and things just keep happening to you. How can you do this with such a cheery heart? I tell you, people would be able to see Jesus Christ living in me. They would be able to see the light of Christ in their dark and twisted world. People need light. People need to see Jesus. And Paul is saying that living without grumbling or disputing is exactly how to show them the love, mercy, and power of Jesus. Similar to what John 13, 35 says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That if we just love our brothers and sisters in Christ so well, people will know that there's something different about us. People will know that we're not cut from the same cloth per se. They would be able to see the light of Christ shining around us. This love that we have for one another would set us apart from the world, showing them exactly who Jesus is. This living apart from the world 
Whether it be doing everything that the Lord puts in front of us without grumbling or disputing or complaining about them. Whether it be loving our brothers and sisters so well. This being set apart from the world is how we can allow Christ to work through us. The work that he did in us, right? Point one, the work that he did in us will hopefully overflow to those who are around us. Maybe it's the people in our lives. Maybe it's our brothers, our sisters, our parents. Maybe it's just our coworkers or the people that we meet at the grocery store. The work that the Lord did in us will, flow, will overflow into the lives of those around us. You might not even know what God is trying to do in you. But if you just allow that work in you to overflow into the people around you, he is going to use that. And he is going to change people around you and reach those that are around you. I was a youth leader for two years during my time at, uh, in Cambridge. And during this time as a youth pastor, I was really able to walk alongside many students. And it was a really cool opportunity and it was a, a lot of fun. Um, sometimes, you know, we would be walking alongside each other and telling each other about how things are going and they would open about struggles that they were having. Sometimes these struggles were, you know, they had a crush on a girl and the feelings weren't mutual and they were just heartbroken, you know? Um, and sometimes they went much, much deeper than that. And it was current struggles that they were having in their minds or in their homes or whatever it was. There were Two students, however, that I was really able to walk alongside. They would come to me with questions and curiosities and doubts about the historicity and the accuracy of the Bible. We would research both sides. I would show them how accurate the Bible is and how the historicity, the, histor the history of the Bible can be trusted. And they would, you know, go on the, the other side and they would show me that, you know, it can't be trusted because it doesn't say exactly what it says or there's something missing or something's a little bit different than what they read in their history book. We would go back and forth. We would search YouTube videos, hour-long YouTube debates, um, and we would watch them. And, man, I spent hours in trying to show these kids the historicity and the accuracy of the Bible and how the Bible can be trusted. But at the end of the day... They didn't change my mind. And all of the baiting and all of the arguing, it didn't change their mind either. Later, I was told that what really helped was just walking alongside them, was them getting to see my relationship with Jesus, was telling them about my daily devotions and what God was teaching me, talking about the struggles that I had gone through. You see, they were going through something so similar to what I had gone through in Texas. They were being peeled back layer by layer. And so I was able to work with them. The Lord worked in me and that overflowed into their lives. So the work that God did in me, he then used to work through me into the lives of these students. Now, this can sound hard and it can sound scary. And to be completely honest with you, it is. It is hard. It is scary. But if we look back to verse 16 for a second, Paul says to hold fast to the word of life so that we do not labor in vain. I tell you, if we try to do this in our own strength or in our own thoughts or in our own actions, we will fail. We will be laboring in vain. We will be running in vain. But if we hold fast to the word of life, that word of life being the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, if we hold fast to the gospel, we can make it to the day that the Lord comes back. We would be able to see fruit in the lives of those around us. Do you remember being afraid when you were really young, maybe you're outside in the dark or you had to go down to the basement and that was really scary. Or maybe, you know, you fell off your skateboard or your scooter or your bicycle and you scraped your knee. And in those moments, you thought that the world was ending. You thought that it was all over. You were afraid, you were scared, you were hurt. But then 
your mom or your dad comes by and they pick you up and they hold you in their arms and they tell you that it's going to be okay. And you put your little arms around them and you hug their necks as tight as you can because you know that you're safe and you know that you're okay and you know that you can trust them. This is what it means to hold fast to. We have to cling on to the gospel with everything that we have because we know that we are safe and we know that it's going to be okay. So let us hold fast to the word of life and let the Lord work through us. Let's love our brothers and sisters so well that people ask what's different about us. Let's do all things without complaining or arguing about them so the whole world can see the light of Jesus shining through us. And let's show them who Jesus is. So again, what am I supposed to do? Well, one, I can let the Lord work in me. Two, I can let the Lord work through me. And three, I can let the Lord fill me with gladness. Look, at our final two verses today, verses 17 and 18. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Look at what Paul is saying here. He's saying that if everything that he had gone through, all the things that had happened in his life, if all that they amounted to was that he could be poured out as a drink offering for the faith of the Philippians, that he could rejoice in that. And he could count that, and he could rejoice, and he could count that as gladness. So take a second with me here, and let's look at everything that Paul went through. In 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 28, five times I, Paul, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger from the city, danger from the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, apart from everything that we just read, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So everything that we just read, all that Paul had endured, if all that his life amounted to was making sure that the Philippians took their faith into their own hands and experienced God like he had, then he could be glad and rejoice in that. Now, I'm telling you, Paul did not find his gladness in his own flesh or in this world or anything from this world. Psalm 32 verse 11 says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The author, the author of this psalm, David, knew that his gladness came from the Lord. And Paul knew that his gladness came from the Lord. Today, right now, we can let the Lord fill us with gladness because there are some days that we will not find it anywhere else. For a second, I want to go back. Do you remember how Paul started this passage? He started with an exhortation to the Philippians, an encouragement to the Philippians. He encouraged them to take the faith into their own hands. And now at the end of the passage, he brings it back to an exhortation to the Philippians in verse 18. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. He says, the gladness that I've found in the Lord, I want you to experience that. I want you to experience God like I have. To me, this really emphasizes Paul's point that it wasn't about him, that all that he had went through, if it was only so the Philippians could make the faith their own, take their faith into their own hands, that Paul could count that as joy and be glad in that. 
You see, he started with an exhortation to the Philippians. He, he made it about them. And then he brought up his own stories and started telling his own experience. And then there were some words of encouragement in there. And he brings it back to the Philippians, making it truly about them, not about Paul. So it really drives that point for me that Paul could genuinely count it all joy and be glad in that if his life ended up just being for the faith of the Philippians. A month or two ago, I was supposed to meet up with a friend of mine. Um, we hadn't seen each other for a long time, and so we were both really excited about this. We were both really excited to get together. Um, it actually still has been quite some time since we've seen each other. We had been planning this for a while, so we were getting excited about it. But just about a few days, maybe two days or so before we were supposed to meet up, he gives me a call. He says, hey, Caleb, I can't make it anymore. I'm so sorry. I told him, man, it's okay. Don't worry about it. But, you know, what's going on? Um, why can't you make it? He told me that his mother had just been diagnosed about a week ago with type stage 2 cancer. I didn't really have any words to say, to express the emotions that I was feeling. So I said I was so sorry. I asked him how I could be praying for him. You see, just a year or so, maybe two years before this, his younger brother had just defeated cancer himself. So maybe then, at most two short years later, after his brother defeats cancer, his mother then gets diagnosed with cancer. I tell you, I bawled on the spot. I can't even begin to imagine how he's feeling or what he's going through. So I ask him how he's doing. The words that he told me next shook everything that I had thought about this world or that I thought I knew about this world. He said to me, it doesn't make sense and I've never been so sad. But it's going to be okay because God is good. <laughs> Again, I bawled on the spot. What do you mean that everything is going to be okay? How can you tell me that God is good right now? First, your brother battles cancer, and now your mom is battling cancer. How can you tell me that God is good? But God is good, isn't he? And his goodness surpasses our present circumstances. You see, my friend was not counting on anything from this world for his gladness, to give him gladness. It is not that his present circumstances made him glad or that he was rejoicing in those, but the Lord had filled him with gladness. So even in this moment, he could rejoice. In probably the hardest time he has ever had to walk through, he could rejoice. His gladness was from God. So even when it seemed like he was in the darkest spot, when he was lost in this crooked and twisted world, he could be glad in the Lord. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Some days are not going to be fun. Some days are truly going to suck. For my few years of living, I can promise that some days are going to be really hard. Paul promises in Scripture that some days are going to be hard. Even Jesus tells us that we can count on some days being hard if we are following him. And in the midst of that, in the midst of all those hard days, you're going to find yourself in the worst day of your life. Now, you're also going to find yourself somewhere in the midst of that in the best day of your life. But inevitably, there will be the worst day of your life. Maybe you've already had that. Maybe a spouse died or a sibling died or a parent died and it was the, or something worse happened. I don't know. It was the worst day of your life. Or maybe the worst day of your life is yet to come. Maybe it's years and years down the road. Regardless of where you're at, I plead with you to rejoice in the Lord. 
Do not let your gladness come from anything in this world because it will let you down. Rejoice in the Lord and let your gladness come from him. So if you're feeling anything like I have been for the past few months, and if you find yourself asking, what am I supposed to do? Then we can one, let the Lord work in us. Two, let the Lord work through us. And three, let the Lord fill us with gladness. Right? We can let the Lord work in us just like the exhortation that Paul gave to the Philippians in verses 12 and 13 of Philippians 2. Paul gave an exhortation to the Philippians that they would make their faith their own. And that they would let the Lord work in their lives. Maybe he's trying to do a work in you. Or maybe he already has, or maybe it's not yet come. But nonetheless, we can pray that the Lord would do a work in us. We can pray Psalm 139, that the Lord would search us, search me, know me, try me, and lead me into the way everlasting. To try us and to lead us into the way everlasting. Then we can let the Lord work through us. If we do all things without grumbling or disputing about them, just like verse 14 says, we can do this because of the work of the Holy Spirit, because of having the work, the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can do all things without grumbling or disputing or complaining or arguing about them. And we should do it so that one, God feels loved and respected and honored as our heavenly father. And two, so that the way that we live will spill into the lives of those around us. That the people in our lives would be able to see the light of Christ in this crooked and twisted world. And we have the word of life to hold fast to. We have to cling onto the gospel, onto the good news of Jesus Christ. And we can let the Lord fill us with gladness. I say we have to let the Lord fill us with gladness. Life is going to be hard. And we might not know what God is trying to do in us or if God is truly trying to work through us. But we can find joy in him and we can rejoice in him and we can find our gladness in him. If we try and find our gladness in anything that is found in this world, it will fall flat. It will be in vain. But if we find our gladness in him, we can stand until the day that the Lord comes back. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for using Paul to write this letter to the Philippians and that we can take it today into our own hearts. God, again, I pray that you would let this sink into our hearts. And I pray that you would allow this to work its way into our heads and into our hearts and that we wouldn't leave it today, God, but we would let it build and we would let you work our hearts into something that honors and glorifies you. God, I pray that we would let you work in us. I pray that you would let us work, let you work through us. And I pray, God, that you would let, that we would let you fill us with gladness. God, I pray for everybody watching today that you would fill them with gladness. I pray for everybody watching today that, God, you would do a work in them. I pray that you would give them the courage to allow you to do that work in them, God, because it is scary and it can be hard. But, God, I pray that you would give them the knowledge and the understanding that you're going to be with them every step of the way. God, I pray that for everybody watching that you would do a work through them, God, that you would allow them to see the fruit and the people that are surrounding them and that you would just do such a good work in them that, that would, they would get so excited about that and it would overflow into the lives of those around them. And God, I pray that you, everybody watching, you would be able to fill them with gladness today. God, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know the hardships that they're facing. But God, I pray that you would fill them with gladness. God, again, I pray that you would teach us from this and that we would be able to learn from your word today. And I pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. So again, I just want to thank Jeff and West Village Church for having me today. And I want to thank you all for inviting me to be a part of your Sunday worship.
My prayer for you today is that you would seek the Lord no matter what comes up, no matter what you face in life, and that you would fall on him and that you would depend on him. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. We just saying it's all about Christ alone, and it is. It's all about Him. And as His called out community, uh, we have the opportunity to remind ourselves again that it is all about Him, that we are only able to be called out because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And now He calls us to remember Him, to live in Him, to live through Him, 
and to live for him. And so let's remember uh, what it took. And it took himself, giving of himself. And so on the night that he was betrayed after dinner, he took uh, the bread and he, he passed it around and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Every time you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, West Village, we are church. And so I encourage you this week to get connected. If you want help with that, we would love to hear from you and introduce you to some people uh, who are following Jesus and seeking to know him more. And uh, so just contact the church office. For the rest of you, I encourage you, do not grow weary in getting together. Do not forsake it. Um, because once we get into it, we realize just how important it is and it's what we're looking for. Have a great week in him. We'll see you next week.